Hello, traders. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Barbara Nicodimou, market analyst at JFD Brokers. This is the first webinar of the series Major Economies Insights, and they have chosen a whole topic for this year, the British monetary policy ahead of the UK referendum. Will the Bank of England raise its interest rates in 2016 or not? A question that culminated after Fed raised its interest rate for the first time in nearly a decade and got more intense, uh, intense uh, as the UK referendum looms. As, you, as usual, here is the risk disclaimer of the company. To summarize it, the risk disclaimer writes that the forex trading is a risky endeavor and it does involve a significant amount of leverage which can amplify your losses as your gains. Moreover, it's important that not all the trading suggestions apply to all the traders. Uh, thus, if it's necessary, you can seek independent advice. During the next hour, we'll, cover, uh, we'll review fundamentally the UK economy, take a look at the current monetary policy and the impact that had from Fed's rate hike. I uh, couldn't, of course, skip Brexit and its consequences as it directly affects the domestic economy. Going forward, uh, we'll see where the British pound exchange rate stands and make our forecast applying technical analysis. And at last, combine our fundamental and technical forecast for the future of the UK economy. At the end of the webinar, I will be happy to discuss my view with you and learn your thoughts about the subject. Uh, you can send me an email with your comments or anything from the webinar that may concern you. The video of the webinar will be soon published on YouTube on the channel of JFD Brokers, where you can leave your comments and your general feedback. We start from the first chapter that we will cover the fundamental review of the UK economy. The first indicator to look at uh, is the headline GDP or gross domestic product and find out what it drives it. Here I plot the GDP growth and the market services purchasing managers index, which are represented by the blue columns and the gray line uh, respectively. At a glance, the two indicators are clearly correlated, which is fully understandable as the services sector accounts for more than 75% of the total GDP. The services sector faced a recession during the third and the fourth quarter of 2012 that dragged down the GDP. Later, as we see, services expanded rapidly, and this is when the economy was advancing, advancing by 2.8% following quarters of expansion less than 1.5%. In the middle of 2014, the services sector started to decline again on a slower rate this time. At this stage, the GDP uh, continued to grow on a robust pace for a year, but it couldn't be supported more and started slowing down in the first quarter of 2015. Note that it currently stands below 2%. In my opinion, figures around 2% and above are satisfactory for the bank to tighten the monetary policy. Two other significant sectors that affect the GDP in the UK are the manufacturing and the construction sectors. Of course, it's a valid point if you say that this is logical as the two sectors affect each other. If the construction is down, the need of manufacturing products is down too at the opposite. Similarly, if a lot of buildings are constructed, there is an increased need of materials, furniture, and many other things. However, I thought that it, it is ter it's interesting to take a look how the manufacturing production on the left chart and the construction output on the right chart perform in relation to the GDP growth. Another, another significant sector of GDP, and the last one we'll study, is the government's current account. The government's current account deficit widened to a record high the last quarter of 2015. For 2015 as a whole, the trade deficit ballooned to £96.2 billion, or 5.2% of the annual GDP, the highest since records began in 1948. It's worth to mention that since quarter three of uh, 1998, the current account has never turned to surplus. A significant factor that affects negatively the current account is the negative trade balance. Over the last 15 years, the UK has negative trade balance, which means trade deficit, and this in turn drives to extremely high deficit in the current account. Even though they managed to narrow the deficit less than 1.5 million pounds for the three months during 2015, May, June, and September, it ballooned again by an additional deficit over 4 billion pounds in October and even more in November. 
It started to narrow the last two months, but following the UK annual budget report announced a few weeks ago from the Chancellor of Exchequer, we will not see a positive balance very soon, despite his last year's plan. The Chancellor was planning to narrow the trade deficit and even turn it to surplus, but then expected recent global instability and the high vulnerability of the plants was a bad combination that didn't work out. At a glance, we see that government's trade balance improves for a few months and then declines again, but the most bold observation is the falling linear trend line, which is shown on the chart with the grey dotted line. The 55% of UK's exports are going to Europe and the strong sterling versus the euro didn't help the exports. Since the middle of 2013 to 2015, the euro depreciated more than 20% against the sterling and the exports slashed severely the second half of 2015 after a rally in the first half. Uh, if the current situation continues as it is, and by that I mean UK to stay in the European Union, an improvement in Eurozone's economic and financial conditions as well as stronger growth prospects in advanced economies are likely to bolster the demand for UK exports and therefore the pace of economic expansion. In 2015, the economy expanded by 2.2%. According to the International Monetary Fund, or as it's widely known, IMF, <clears throat> the GDP will continue to advance on an average pace of 2.2% in 2016 and will decelerate slightly to 2.1% in the long-term future of 2020. So, the overall conclusion from the UK GDP is that the economy expands on a healthy pace and with a sufficient rate for the central bank to raise interest, interest rates. But there are some clouds over this issue. According to the statements of Mark Carney, the governor of Bank of England, the global slowdown, the low oil prices and the more bold issue for UK, the Brexit, may hold back the growth. As we said before, the 55% of the UK exports are going to Europe. Thus, if UK leaves the European Union, it's very likely this number to decrease due to the taxes must be paid from the instant European Union receivers. <clears throat> A major issue that holds back policymakers from tightening the monetary policy is inflation rate. The inflation outlook remained gloomy in 2015, keeping back the BOE policymakers from raising the interest rates. Let's take this from the beginning. As we see here at the last quarter of 2013, the inflation was around central bank's 2% target. This, uh, the year of 2014 started with inflation to be slightly below 2% and above 1.5%. But afterwards, and more specifically from June, it started to decline and ended up to around zero at the beginning of 2015. UK has been fighting deflation in the whole last year with external handwits to burn the situation. At the end of 2015, more specifically in December, the inflation picked up to 0.2%, raising optimism uh, that it started to increase towards 2%. Indeed, it rose by 0.3% uh, the first two months, which is very low, but surely better than zero or negative. Uh, if you see the bigger picture, it shows a slow but steady increase. However, in my opinion, the inflation is not safe yet for a rate hike. The 0.3% can be easily turned negative again. The IMF uh, forecasted that inflation rate will rise to 1.5% until the end of this year. The inflation outlook is expected to remain subdued in the beginning of 2016 and to pick up in the second half, uh, while the IMF projected that inflation is set to reach BOE's 2% target in 2020. However, the Bank of England is likely to hike interest rates even if inflation is below central bank's target, as I will not expect it to reach 2% soon. Moreover, I would expect the IMF to downgrade its forecast in the next publications and remain below 1% longer due to the financial instability caused by the political turmoil in Europe and the Brexit concerns. The next major sector we'll need to study to evaluate the UK economic situation is the labour market. I will separate this sector in four categories, but I will go through them pretty quickly. First of all, uh, let's see the headline indicator for the country's labour market, the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate, or otherwise the jobless rate, represents the proportion of people who are currently seeking for a job but are still unemployed. 
The country's unemployment rate fell to 5.1%, the lowest since October 2005, which means the best situation has been the last 10 years. Note that uh, the unemployment rate figure in the UK represents the average unemployment rate for the last three months. So, looking on the chart, the three months to November, the unemployment rate goes at a record low level. After it peaked at 8.5 the three months to November 2011, the jobless rate has been falling at a steady pace and remained stable at 5.1% the last two months. On the top of that, uh, the employment rate, the proportion of people aged from 16 to 64 who are working, was 74% in October, the highest since records began in 1971. Uh, the good news for the UK labour market does not stop here. The average weekly earnings, including bonus, increased over 2.5% on average in 2015, the steepest pace of growth since 2011. The average weekly earnings suffered a significant slowdown in 2014, where it even turned to negative growth, which means contraction. After that, the wages were increasing and reached a growth more than 3% in 2015. The growth slowed down later, but on average, it remained above 2%. So, as the unemployment rate was decreasing, the wage growth was picking up, a strong sign of recovery and it's worth to notice that they remained at the same level for the first month of 2016. The labor sector experienced some clowns during the year uh, due to the slight increase of the claim and count change. The number of people claiming unemployment benefits was continually increasing by big numbers. However, in the second quarter of 2015, the unemployment benefits started to decrease by small numbers and even to increase in the third quarter, indicating a lack of expansion. But the figures returned to their normal levels the last two months of the year and continued that way in January and February, totaling a decrease of 50,000 to the number of people claiming jobless benefits. So, the total picture is that the labour market of England is very strong, it's currently at the best situation of the last years, and it's doubtful if it can become even better. Thus, uh, if Bank of England decides to tighten its monetary policy, the labour market is not an obstacle at all. But where does the current economy policy stand? In September 2008, the current uh, the central bank started a series of consecutive small rate cuts that led the benchmark interest rates from 5% to 0.5% in seven months. This is represented on the chart with the blue line. Since then, the BOE Monetary Policy Committee votes monthly to keep the repo rate at the record low of 0.5%, but there are notable changes in the policymakers' voting pattern, uh, which we'll see in a while. During this period, when the benchmark interest rates were on hold, and more specifically in September 2009, the central bank started an asset purchase facility to buy high-quality assets. Basically, this means that the bank creates new money electronically to buy financial assets like government bonds. This process aims to directly increase private sector spending in the economy and return inflation to target. At the beginning, the amount of purchased assets was £65 billion and reached the amount of £375 billion in mid-2012, where uh, it, currently, it currently stands until now. Now, regarding the interest rates, uh, during the last the quarter of 2015, economists believe that the committee would vote for a rate hike. However, the low inflation in combination with the global risks prevented the bank from such move. Only one of the nine policymakers uh, was voting for a rate hike for the last five months of 2015, who stopped in January after Fed raised its interest rates. The most probable scenario, without taking uh, account, into account a specific time frame, is that the Bank of England will sometimes start raising interest rates gradually until they reach a normal level that could, that could represent the potency of the economy. The gradual rate hike is expected to take a significant amount of time and will not, uh, it will not be a surprise if the bank starts raising interest rates with low inflation. In such a case, it will raise interest rates just a few times on a very slow pace and then holds off on further action while it assesses economic expansion and consumer price growth. Remember that uh, the UK economy is heavily based on consumer consumption. 
It's worth noting that the bank's monetary policy objective is to deliver price stability, raise inflation back to 2% target uh, while it's supporting growth and employment. Going a little back, the second half of 2015, most of the news headlines uh, were about whether Fed will raise its, in, its main interest rate. Many on and offs were disturbing the market until the last month of 2015 when Fed finally decided to raise the interest rates to 0.5% from the record low has ever been at a quarter basis point. At that point, the question among the market participants uh, was if the Bank of England will follow Fed's tightening policy. From my judgment, uh, this question answered a while later when the market headlines turned to the question if Fed did the right choice. The doubts if the US economy was ready for such move made the Bank of England policymakers to be more hesitant to keep a hawkish stance at the right next month at the policy meeting, even the one policymaker that was voting for a rate hike for a long time entered the rest of the team who votes to leave the monetary policy on hold. The next subject is Brexit, one of the most discussed issues in UK and Europe in general, that will continue to dominate the markets until the referendum takes place in June. Brexit means that the uh, UK will not be a part of the European Union anymore. As you can understand, it's difficult to predict the consequences of such development. It's something that never happened again in the past. What is certainly true to happen is market to be fulfilled by uncertainty. This can have a serious effect on the pound uh, as well as uh, to the UK as economy. As the Bank of England's governor said, Britain leaving the European Union will be the biggest domestic risk to financial stability. However, remaining in the European Union also carries risks. The European Union reinforced the dynamism of the British economy and correspondingly its ability to grow without generating risks to the bank's primary objectives of monetary and financial stability. Brexit is likely to cause a serious drop to the exchange value of the pound and push some banks uh, to move abroad. The central bank has to be very careful and decisive to keep the monetary and financial stability intact as well as uh, to keep inflation rate near or as near as possible to its target. Another view suggests that in the long term UK can be considered a safe haven for new investments. The Brexit could be the beginning of the collapse of the, Euro of the European Union project and that the pound could be more attractive than the euro. Regarding the labor market, the British firms will have less candidates to choose from as it will not be easy for the companies to employ workers outside of Britain. But on the other side, the labor market that is already strong will become stronger. Less unemployment, which means higher wage growth to attract employees and in turn higher wages mean increased consumer spending and accelerated, accelerated ascent of the GDP. Let's now see uh, the exchange rate of British pound in a long-term perspective. The blue line represents the pound against the euro and the grey line the pound versus the dollar. As we can see during the global financial crisis in 2008, the sterling collapsed versus both the dollar and the euro as it declined by 34%. Both pairs were, uh, both pairs were being traded sideways until middle of 2013, when both started to gain ground and rose around uh, 13%, which means that both pairs rebounded from the financial crisis lows. However, after the reflection point in the middle of 2014, they started to diverge. The pound continued to get stronger against the euro and covered almost all of its earlier losses, while the pound was plunging versus the dollar. Since the second quarter of 2015, the two pairs started to perform similarly again, and more specifically, pound is being depreciated versus both the dollar and the euro. Note that pound versus the dollar is currently being traded near the record low levels has been during the crisis. Let's see specifically the British pound versus the euro. Looking on the monthly chart, we see that the pair is traded in a clear downtrend, creating lower highs and lower lows. The euro GBP pair peaked at, uh, 80 and at 98 uh, in December 2008, when the pound plunged following the global financial crisis. Later, the pound entered the downtrend against the euro, and the euro GBP pair made its last bottom so far at 0.6930, recording losses of 29.3%. After the pair found support at the level 0.6930, 
uh, it recovered sharply, approximately 16% up. It recorded four consecutive winning months and is already 2% up for the first week of April. So, it's obvious that the pair is being traded in a sloping channel and is currently in a retracement that will test the upper line of the sloping channel. A break above it, it will be a turning point and a trend reversal for the pair. Now, going down to a lower time frame, uh, we'll spot the levels we need to, work, to have in mind ahead of UK referendum, which could have significant impact on the pound crosses. You can see on your screen the weekly chart, which shows the medium-term outlook. We can see that the price is moving above the significant support of uh, 0.75 and uh, 75.80. At the same level, the price is trending above all of the simple moving averages, the 50, 100, and 200. Following this aggressive rally, you can see that the bulls are under strong momentum and now they threaten to break above the long-term descending trend line, which started back in early 2009. A clear break above the trend line, it will signal a trend reversal. However, I will need some additional confirmation for the bias to turn positive. This confirmation may be a daily or a weekly close above the upper line of the channel. Now, considering the strong, uh, the strong rally we have seen from 69.30, where the price has gained 16%, I would expect the long traders to uh, start locking their profits and slow down the bullish momentum. The most possible scenario and most ideal position for the bulls to exit their trades will be near the trend line, where at the same time, I believe the short players will enter the market to trade the continuation of the downtrend. Thus, uh, having this in mind, the level to watch for the next week will be uh, 0.8170, where a big battle will take place since I consider this level as a turning point for the pair. Therefore, a break above the trend line uh, at the 8170 will open the way for 0.88. At that uh, level, I would expect the first pullback to test the trend line and 8170 level from the upside and then the pair to continue rising. On the other hand, if the bears win the battle at the area around 8170, they could push the price down and the first two obstacles to watch will be 7780 and 75, which will mark the continuation of the downtrend. Also, to confirm the continuation of the downtrend, I will need a break below the 200 simple moving average, roughly around 0.79. The answer to our question, if Bank of England will raise interest rates in 2016, uh, is it's li very likely, but not soon. I wouldn't expect the Bank of England to raise interest rates before the UK referendum. After the referendum takes place on, on 23rd uh, of uh, June, the uh, Central Bank will wait for a while for the markets to calm down and accept the result, uh, whatever it will be, and then start considering when is the right time for a rate hike. If the economic conditions continue to be like now with improved inflation rate and slightly better GDP growth, I can see uh, the Bank of England doing its first rate hike by a quarter basis point on the last quarter of 2016 or at the first half of 2017. As I said before, inflation rates will not necessarily reach Bank's 2% target, but in my opinion, it should be at a more stable condition near 1% before the Bank raises its interest rates. And this is the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for your attention. Please feel free to join our next webinars. You can check the full list of upcoming webinars at JFT Workers website at the Ask JFT tab. The next scheduled webinar is Build Your Strategy on 14th of April by FTVLOS Review. Have a nice evening, guys. Thank you. Thank you for attending.